Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. This is the Sparks to Skyscrapers podcast. Uh, the show is all about innovation, developing ideas, and bringing them from a spark to a skyscraper. Today, we have a very special guest, President of our Science College, Brock Blomberg. President Blomberg, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thanks for inviting me, Jim. No problem. Um, so we're going to talk about all about COVID-19 innovations today, process of bringing students back to a college campus in the midst of a pandemic. You've had a very successful semester. So first of all, I just want you to introduce yourself a little bit. I know you're from El Paso, Texas. Is that correct? Wow. Yeah, I know. I, I know. I've, I've, a little bit of research. Not, just a Wikipedia. Nothing. No big deal. <laughs> so tell us your story. How did you get from El Paso to our sinus school? And did you know what did you want to do when you were growing sure, up? All that, sure. all that good stuff. So I was actually born uh, as a foster kid. And I didn't know much about college. I was born in Texas, as you, as you yeah. know. And I was uh, uh, eventually adopted into a military family. And we moved all over. I, I didn't know what college was. I sort of thought it was like an animal house when Belushi has like college. <laughs> I had no, no concept. And so when I had, a, it was time to go to college. I had an Army ROTC scholarship. I'm a veteran. This is Veterans Day. Right. So you're welcome to say happy Veterans, happy veterans there Day. There you go. No, but I, anyway. Um, and uh, uh, there was a college very similar to our sinus, a small liberal arts college. And it gave uh, more financial aid to me in addition to, this, right. to that. So my dad says, you're going there. Right. So I didn't know anything about what I was going to get. And, and this type of an experience of learning how to really, um, you know, get to know your faculty members in a real intimate thoughtful way, a small school experience, right? changed my life. And so I decided this is really for the most part what I wanted to do. And while I've worked sometimes in public affairs, I worked at the White House, I've worked off Wall Street, the Federal Reserve. Most of my time have been in institutions like this. I was at Wellesley College. I was at Claremont McKenna College. And I learned you could ask some really good questions there. But what really drew me to our sinus is that you can ask the right questions. Right. Because I think with our new our sinus quest curriculum, and the way that we approach, it, it's a little different. Right, it's right. not just some of those colleges are wonderful. I loved being at them, but they're more elitist in that sense. Absolutely. Here at Hitter Sinus, there's more of a round table approach. That's it's one thing I loved about it when I was touring. It's those questions. If you want to, do you want to, do you want to refresh the audience on those questions if they don't know? Oh, but... yeah. What matters to me? <laughs> right. uh, you know, how do I understand the world? How should we live together? And it ends with what will I do? Absolutely. And I always love that punctuation because sometimes liberal arts gets a little bad rap as it's just a bunch of pointy headed academics sitting in a certain, you know, late yeah. at night asking some deep questions. You were saying you started your first podcast with yeah. kind of debate questions. But, you know, while we do that, we also want to do things. So the what will I do think I think is really important. That's something you imagine does. And that's a real important part of our college. Absolutely. Getting into the pandemic, I know. So you guys last spring, was it March that it that it started and it hit and you guys basically extended spring break? You had to go from there. So it, you, it you was, wanted to take us through that first progress. Sure. When it first hit, what's your reaction? Where do you even start? Because I know for a lot of entrepreneurs, where do I even start? That's the question that they're always asking. They might have a great idea, don't even know where to begin. Well, you know, I think one of the things that helped in this is twofold. My training and, and, and our training was to be community. Well, I was at a liberal arts college. And so you have to learn those types of skills at a liberal arts college, how to collaborate, right. how to think uh, creatively and how to ask critical questions and make just decisions. And so it wasn't just my decision. We had to talk to a lot of the members of the, of the college, different constituents and get a handle on what's going on. And I think my background being a, uh, an ex professor, uh, we do experiments all all the while. So this was a real big experiment. Huge experiment. Huge Massive, experiment. right? There's no playbook for a pandemic no, hitting in no, the middle of a no semester. Playbook. And you know, I will tell you, uh, things ch change like this. The, the one um, adage I would say is the half-life of decisions in this environment is about a week. Yeah. You come up with a great plan um, and then you have to make adjustments and you have to be nimble. That's where I think colleges like Ursinus have an advantage because we're small. Right. And uh, it's not all like my basketball game, small and slow. Uh, you got to be <laughs> small and nimble. And I think that that's, you know, really worked to our advantage. So when we first heard about the pandemic, I didn't know how serious it was going to be. And I, and it was, and I had a conversation with Mark Schneider, the dean of the college. And I'm like, is, is this, you know, are we it's overreacting? Thing, right? Is this yeah. going to be really? And it became clear soon enough that right. this was a serious matter. So we began with this kind of measured approach. We're going to first just extend spring break and we're going to see what it's like. Right. And then obviously it turned out to be very serious. 
So to keep the welfare and safety of the students at the highest level, we then threw us uh, through a series of decisions. You know, we had to cancel sports. We had to do everything, uh, you know, virtual. I don't want to create bad memories for how difficult that spring semester was, particularly for seniors. Right. Absolutely. I mean, that's heartbreaking. Yeah. You, senior in high school. I was a senior in high school. Yeah. It, it's not fun. It exactly. Not fun. All your friends, all that yeah. time of experience you want, unfortunately, had to, 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 to uh, evaporate. Right. So then, um, you know, then the question began, you know, what about in the fall? When you started the online learning process, was it something that classes here were already online, like a few classes were already online? So you just took that format and you expanded it to all classes? No, so, actually. So you just, this is, this is what brand new. I give the faculty an enormous amount of credit. Right. What, when we said we're going to extend spring break for two weeks, we said to the faculty during that time, you're going to have to figure you know, it out, figure it out, right? right? You're going to have to get more comfortable with Zoom, uh, with mm -hmm. with the different types of technologies. You're going to have to think about ways that you can actually deliver. And you can imagine for labs and things like that, yeah. that's really, really complicated. Absolutely. So I give the faculty an incredible, enormous amount of credit. And I do know that the virtual experience in the, the spring wasn't as as uh, impactful as the right. in residence, um, but I will tell you, I think they did a tremendous job of of helping students through that crazy, crazy semester. Absolutely. So now, so now you're through that original spring where it's obviously just got to kind of figure it out. You have some time to plan now. When you were planning for the fall semester, what kind of ideas did you have at first about things like testing, dining, being in the classroom, capacities in a classroom? I know when I started getting emails about this stuff, you weren't even sure about campus events at first. Um, and then you kind of came to the decision that it wouldn't be a good idea to have mm -hmm. events on campus, which is a smart decision during a pandemic. But um, all of that, the thinking that went into that, is there anything that jumps out right away as like an innovation or, or an idea that took the most planning? There is, but let me set okay. it up a little bit. Okay. So, cause I think that'll make a little more sense in right. terms of this. It, it's also important to note that as this is going on, uh, we didn't know what the fall would look like. Early indications were, well, maybe this will just be over in a month or two. In right. fact, the president said that we yeah. can talk about the politics right. or not, but anyway, there was a lot of information out there where there was uncertainty about the fall. And so um, we wanted to get into a real thoughtful planning phase, and we had all summer to do it. And so I empowered Mark Schneider, the dean of the college, to head our virus task force. And he brought in on a daily basis members throughout the community, people, faculty members, staff people, people who, who dealt with the things you were talking about, safety issues, uh, uh, residence life, uh, dining. Right. And we wanted to get a handle on what would be the things that we can control and what we can't control. And if you can control the things you can control, is this going to keep your welfare and safety at the highest level? And so we had to come up with a couple of, you know, guiding principles. The principle was if we were going to go in person. And my point was, let's extend this theory, this experiment, as long as we can, until we can't. Right. Um, the guiding principle is it has to be at least as safe on campus as it is in the surrounding community. Otherwise, it's just not gonna that's work. not going to work. And what's going to be, and this is, I'll get to the key innovation right. point in a second. What's going to be the main way that we're going to be able to ensure that? And that's got to be testing. Yeah. Uh, because yeah, otherwise, no campus, right? we have no yeah. idea, is it healthy or not healthy? And um, as we're planning through the year, it seemed like testing wasn't going to be a big deal. A lot of people were like, we had some uh, big providers. Um, uh, uh, Quest Diagnostics is one of them. LabCorp is right. another one. And they said, we, we do this for a living. You know, we're, we can help you with that. So the problem was everyone wanted to get testing. Right? Right. <laughs> and I think they're great. They're great firms. So no disrespect, they, but they got overloaded. And then all of a sudden the idea was, well, we can, we can do it, but we're not going to be able to get you a test result for 10, 15 days. Well, that doesn't do us any good because mm -hmm. if someone has it, we, one of the things that we, we modeled out, we actually took a, you know, a mathematical model. What if someone gets it? What happens to the infection rates? If you don't know within a week. Well, they could go, right. they could skyrocket. And so testing became the main, main challenge for us. And if the overall big testing um, uh, firms can't get it back to you for a couple weeks, there's no, that, that's a non-starter. And that's when we saw a lot of our sister institutions essentially say, we're going 
online, online or online. we're going really de-densified or we're changing our testing strategy. Here's where the innovation hit us as we started thinking creatively. Well, well, where can we come up? We can't go to the big firms. Mm -hmm. Where can we find alternatives? And what we did here is we started talking to other colleges and universities like ourselves. And we found out that Juniata had had a, an idea. And so often when innovation isn't just that you come up with the idea by yourself, sometimes innovation is imitation. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. and I think understanding these are twins of the same right. kind of thing, that was really important. So we imitated, we, we essentially started with, with their work and that allowed us to bring the people to campus. And then the second point, and then I'll stop, is we also didn't know if we brought everybody in at once, if right. that was going to be too much. And so that's why the second innovation was, let's start with first years, Let's bring in that that tranche. That's my economics right. word uh, for the yeah, day. Yeah, there you go. Uh, and we'll see how that works. And then if that uh, works out well, then we'll bring the rest of the students to campus. So that we made that decision in the middle of the summer. Yep. We still didn't nail it down because if if we weren't sure if these things were going to transpire, then we were going to have to pull the plug. And so we weren't 100% sure of these things until more and more of these things fell in place. It's so fascinating. We, As you mentioned imitation. Innovation is imitation a lot of times. Along with that, it it's imitation and then building upon that. And so you, you might imitate someone and then see, okay, what can I do better? And for you guys at home trying to start a business or, or a brand, one thing that is huge is being able to see what someone is doing well and then realizing what can I improve upon that. I think the other piece that's really vitally important here is that when you're engaging in this process, it's a trust building exercise. And so all right. the stakeholders that are involved, they have to buy in. Mm -hmm. If you have a real creative idea and you're innovating and imitating and extending and right. doing all the things you said, but all of the people around you are like, I don't believe you, you're yeah. crazy, go away from me, you're not going to be able to move. So the other thing that was really important to us is that we had to do a lot of trust building with yeah. build it, beginning with this virus task force. Yeah. So when we were having these conversations, it wasn't it was one thing to get the 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 the, the testing materials. Mm -hmm. It was another thing to believe that we could actually facilitate the testing. So we had one innovation that we you know what we imitated and extended is we actually had to bring initially some outside providers to do the testing, and then as we watched what they did, eventually we started testing ourselves. Mm -hmm. So we learned from them, and then we took that model and extended it even further. But none of this would have happened if we weren't able to get a consensus that yes, this is something we can actually do. And I will tell you in those conversations, you can imagine not everybody on day one was like, yeah, this is gonna work. So it took a lot of real conversations, belief in science and data, belief in our students actually. One of the concerns we had is that's an unknown. We can't control student behavior. You know, I a hundred years ago, a lot of 18 to 22 year olds doing say, whatever the heck they want, right? And a hundred years ago when I was your age, uh, you know, I'm not sure I would have, right. uh, but but our students have been really, really good so far. You mentioned the testing plan. We were just talking about the testing plan, but the shift in the in the companies. Yes. Um, is there so the reasoning behind that? Was it false positives? Was it just that it's it's the new one is more effective, cheaper? The it, reasoning it, behind it, it. It's all of those things. Yeah. So this is the other thing that's important, I think, with innovating is that you have beta versions, right. and as you go along and you learn you want to improve upon it. And like I mentioned earlier, all these decisions are about a week and then you reevaluate. Right. Actually, I want, to, I want to clarify. So we, we started off with a certain brand of, one of them was uh, like an oral test. That it was the, like a, the throat swab and then we've switched like midway through the semester to a, to a nasal swab. And so that's what we're talking about right now. Right, that's exactly right. The help with the firm that worked with Juniata, right. uh, they were the, 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 the deep, uh, swab right. in the back of the throat. And we actually had a firm do that for us because we had no experience in that. Right. That creates two things that we wanted to improve on. One, it seemed like it was more uncomfortable for the students. It, it definitely was. That one was not fun. <laughs> These, I don't even mind the new ones. These yeah. ones, the old ones. Right. It looked, you dreaded it. It was not good. <laughs> it looked really awful. Yeah. So you got to get tested anyway. And now you're getting tested in an uncomfortable way. And secondly, um, we, we, the people coming on campus, they don't know our community as, as, as well. They don't know our systems as well. So if we could figure out a way to do it ourselves, then that, then that's going to get a little closer and the information flow is going to be easier and all of that kind of stuff. So we were looking 
if we could find a cheaper alternative, and we did. We found a, a testing agency out of uh, MIT and Harvard that said, we'll give you your tests. Right. And after watching everybody do it for three weeks, we asked our local community, can you now test this way? And they said, yes. And so that is the why we moved in that direction. We, we switched providers right. and we switched our, our uh, the way we facilitated the testing. And the reason we did that is, as I was saying to you earlier, that um, you know when you innovate, you want to continue to innovate. The innovation right. doesn't stop at, right. the, at the spark of the idea. After beta type of testing, you want to always uh, learn and do a better job. And so we could carry that out with our community. With the, after the three weeks, you said exactly. Right, so. so after three weeks of of this sort of work, we realized we could do it ourselves. So that was at a fraction of the cost. Right. That's an important. COVID, Possibly important, right? I mean, this is a very. I, I hope everyone understands. This is expensive time for all yeah. uh, places. You know that you know um, restaurants, uh, mom pop, all, all economic activity is being strained right now, Absolutely. to include colleges and universities. So if we can save a dollar, we'll save a dollar. What like creative ideas that you guys had produced such a good change that they could stay maybe in the future? Because I know a lot of times pressure creates diamonds, right? And so the takeout dining, I have to say, extremely convenient. A lot of times when I'm running to a class or, or um, I have something to do, that's one, that's one that jumps out to me. I don't know if you guys are planning on keeping that, but even like online learning or, or just any innovation that you can think of that you might keep going forward even after the pandemic. Well, I think, you know, one of the things in our current strategic plan is that we champion risk taking. That's one of our objectives. And so we did a lot of that. And I don't know which ones we're going to keep, but I do think we need to evaluate several because I think there's some good potential. The first one that comes to my mind is um, the block CIE section. Right. So we've always done CIE in a traditional model. This time we let our first years come on campus for three weeks and let them own campus. Yeah, it was fantastic. Intensive. So, so CIE is um, it's a class that all first year students have to take here at our sinus. A lot of comprehensive reading um, and a lot of text that that address those four questions that that President Blomberg mentioned earlier. It's really comprehensive in reading, writing, and discussion. That's the most important part, allowing students from different backgrounds to come together and discuss texts that have a lot of meaning behind the actual words. There's a lot of meaning in these texts that, we're, that we have to read. What we did the first three weeks of the semester was, was just CIE. That's the only class we took. It was three, four hours a day. And it actually worked out fantastic because it lightened the course load for first years afterwards, only having to take three classes rather than four, including CIE. And it also just allowed for, for us to get used to the COVID protocol. Every decision we're going to make, we're going to evaluate right. science and data all the way through. That's when we heard some positive feedback. Right. So maybe for, for every year, every other year, we're going to deliver CIE that way right. so that you get that immersive experience. But it feels kind of cool when you own the campus, right. you know, I, and, great, and yeah. hear stories about people going out and they're deciding to do yoga together and, you know, in ways that would feel a little more intimidating potentially if you have, you know, seniors walking around or et cetera, et cetera. So that's one innovation. Um, I think, you know, you point to a couple other ones, the tents, the out, outside tents, outside classrooms, right. you know, we haven't used those before. If the weather holds up, it's kind of an interesting way to learn. Maybe this is something that will continue. Um, I think some elements of uh, a grab and go, I think, could right. be extended. You know, we want to look at that carefully because we also want to encourage people to be able to uh, uh, have the social environment right. and stumble upon each other in a good way. Right. I mean, you know, um, but that's uh, another possibility that we want to uh, look at. You mentioned, you know, how much virtual uh, classes that we'd have. You know, I think that's going to be largely left up to the faculty and how they want to mm -hmm. teach. But from what I've heard from students, you know, I think students really do appreciate the to the the in person. But there are probably one or two classes every now and then you would like to be able to take virtually. And so maybe if some faculty were more comfortable. Maybe your portfolio of classes you're taking aren't four in person. Maybe it's three in person and one right, not right. Or, or not. These are the things we have to look at. Talked a lot about things that have worked really well for us. I know a lot of times with innovation, things don't always go as planned. It seems like everything's running great. But is there anything that you can think of that we're still struggling with as a campus community that we can get better with? Well, you know, I wouldn't use the word struggle. I would say put differently, I'd say, what can we do better? I think one of the hardest things to do in this environment is communicate. It's hard to communicate anyway, I found. If I write an email, how many of my emails do you read? Uh, 
I mean, I open them. I skim. <laughs> I skim. Right. I skim them. And, I read the, the election ones were very nice. Okay. I, I will say okay. that. I read those. And, and if you use social media and we, you know, put something on Instagram, maybe that gets a different attention. People get a lot of Zoom fatigue. Absolutely. So I think, you know, trying to find a different way to communicate across all these fora, we need to learn better how to make that not feel, you know, so exhausting. I think on the mental health uh, side and the social justice side, there's a lot of anguish in our world today, uh, regardless of your opinions about, you know, politics and, and the like. Um, and I think trying to find a way that we can, you know, reach people and, and ensure that they're supported. I think um, that's a challenge. Yeah. And I think we're trying really hard there, but I think that's really hard because you're not in your traditional way able to 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 stumble upon people again or, or hear it from the usual organic methods. Moving forward into the spring semester, with the rise of the infection rates in Montgomery County, uh, what do you see as the plan going forward? Can anything change based on what's going on outside of the campus community? Or is this bubble sufficient enough to hold up even in the spring semester if the infection rate continues to rise? You know, I, I've said all along that we'll use data and science as our guide. And um, that's part of the data and science is we, we need to know how the rest of the community is doing. If you look at the national numbers, I mean, the numbers are, are looking pretty stark. We are in this second wave right, right. now. Um, I will tell you one of the things we talked about uh, as a leadership team was we originally talked about Thanksgiving. Would we uh, go, back. go back or not? Um, we decided to stick with the plan and uh, go virtual after Thanksgiving. This was part of the reason why. We wanted to make sure that we were in a safe environment. Um, we're going to evaluate. It is not impossible on January 20th if things look unsafe at the highest level, that we may say, well, geez, we can't do this. Right. Um, my best guess, though, following what I've heard from people, is that it's going to go up for a while, and then it's going to come back down. Uh, it, particularly if we start following really good protocols. I know that the government's talking about you know, a new um, advisory board right. that might give us some, some feedback. And so my, my hope is that uh, in January that we will not be in the current state. But yes... We definitely look at outside uh, community, and if things don't look safe, we're not putting ourselves in harm's way. One thing that you guys have done, rather than giving us a full week-long spring break, you put it up into break days. Now, personally, that's an email that I did read. <laughs> I saw it's break days, which is extremely helpful because we, we've kind of gone for the long haul in the fall semester. And it's one of those things that once when you make a plan, sometimes there's flaws, and you, and you go forward and you build upon that. And I think the break days... Rather than having a full spring break, we have full week of days sprinkled throughout the semester um, for kind of mental health and, and being able to take a take a breather from the, the strenuous course load sometimes. Is there anything else in the spring that's going to be different or what, what, what's the plan for the spring in general? So, so I think there's a couple things. We actually stopped ourselves from doing too much innovation. Right. Uh, it's working, right? Yeah. Maybe well, broke, don't fix it. So, so some people have suggested maybe we should start classes a couple weeks later. Right. And then extend things into June or something like that, which is what some colleges and universities are doing. We thought, given again that we don't know what it's going to look like, fooling around with the calendar and things, things have worked, we didn't move that. Um, so things like that is probably what we did more than anything else. Because our best guess is the spring's going to have a lot more innovations, both in the testing front and potentially the vaccine front. Definitely, so yeah, for us to do a lot of you know, second guessing of things and, and recreating things at this point is, 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 a, is potentially a challenge. I will say uh, one of the things we're looking to do is, is again, uh, innovate on testing. Right. So right now we use something called a PCR test. And a PCR test um, is 99.9% .9 precise. It is the gold standard of precision. It's also incredibly costly. Yeah. Um, there are new innovations in testing called antigen tests, which are still above 90%, but they're not quite as precise, much cheaper. And here's what you'll like, far less invasive. Right. It's a, it's a quick swab and you know, the result in like 20 minutes, right. the rapid, so, the rapid it's a test, rapid right? test. And so one of the things we want to do is work with both of these sorts of things to be able to get that less invasive, quicker test out, but not. Uh, lose our precision in testing. So we'll probably 
um, you know, innovate in testing in, in a hybrid way between these two different tests to ensure that everyone's safe, but also to allow for an easier, you know, uh, and maybe more rapid testing. You mentioned the effectiveness rate of these tests. I know one of my friends did test positive. A couple of days later, he tested negative. This was back with the throat swab test. So I don't know if you want to address any like false positive. I'm happy to do it. Right. First off, I'll say I don't think there is a side because right. really it's just trying to manage through this crazy right. time period. And so you're going to, you know, it's sort of like in the middle of a wartime situation you're going to break some eggs when you make an omelet right. and you got to understand that going in. So no disrespect to your right, no, friend. Exactly. I'm, I'm sure I'd be frustrated too. Right. Um, you know, I, I think that we went in understanding, unfortunately, that these sorts of, these are the costs right. that, uh, and I know it's not fair to the people who, who bear the brunt of those costs, right. but that's the sort of things that just have to happen in order for you to be able to, ensure at some high level that the overall community is safe. Candidly, most of our people that have tested positive, and uh, I think across the semester, it's a little over 20 or so that have tested positive, um, have been asymptomatic. Yeah. So that means that from their own standpoint, they're like, I'm not even sick. Yeah. Why am I? But the reason you're doing that isn't just for you. It's for the community safety, it could be particularly faculty and staff who are older. If you transmit it to them, they may not have the same kind of positive characteristic. But to your question about the precision of the tests, what happens is these PCR tests, because they're so precise, sometimes they will actually find a positive based on something that you may have had it months ago right. and it's still deep down the speck of stuff is still in your system but it will it will right. it will catch that and we don't know if that's what's going on or if you just got it yesterday that's right. that's the and and that's why they're they're wonderful in the sense of that precise but that's why it can be frustrating because we don't know when you get it and they'll give some these are what some people call false positives right. because it's capturing you know, infinitesimal, maybe not infinitesimal, but smaller quantities of it that may, may no longer mean you're trans, uh, you can, you can transmit it, but we, we don't have the ability to differentiate. Right. That's why we're hoping with the newer tests, these antigen tests, that we can work those two things together to hopefully have less of that. One thing we haven't touched on, student life, social life. What led to that decision of not allowing registered events on campus? I think there's a couple levels here. One is the decisions that we made about the size of get-togethers, actually, we have certain rules we have to follow based on the state. Their protocols are sometimes no more than 25 or no more than 250, depending on the situation, if it's a non-academic uh, event. So that means we can't really even have some of these registered right. events and parties just because we would be out of compliance with state law. Right. So that's one thing. We didn't want to have to create this this environment where students would say, well, you can have an event or a party, but it can only be a certain amount. You can imagine how unfortunate that would be if students were like, well, I'm the 26th person in the room. Sorry, you're not allowed to come in. So that was one element. I think the second element is, is again, safety. We wanted to ensure that we want to keep the risk factor at the lowest amount. And the, we thought the best way to do that would be to find small collectible groups, your family structure, as we're doing here. So it's not as though people can't get together and socialize. You just have to socialize amongst, you know, a group of people that essentially is your small bubble. Right. Um, and so I think that was the motivation going in. You know, this entire process has been a learning experience. I don't see us moving away from that yet because it's worked so well. But, you know, as the environment changes. Vaccines, right? In the if, if testing. A lot can change between a lot when can we change. leave, right? You can imagine a world in which antigen testing, which if it's every, tw you know, you can find out things in 20 minutes. If everybody's going, you know, um, maybe that will change right. because we can test people ahead of time and know with some degree of certainty that you're not spreading the virus. And so mm -hmm. that can change things. So with, with vaccines, with testing, maybe these things will move in the spring. I wouldn't get expectations up yet because until we know you know, the cost structure and the ability to do rapid testing um, and availability of vaccines, we can't really move too fast away from our current scenario. Finally, two-part question. What did you learn from all of this? And what would you like to leave as a message for our campus community going forward? Well, you know, what, what I learned from all of this really is what a special place or sinus is. You know, the number of colleges and universities, the percent of colleges and universities that are either all 
in person or mostly in person is only about a quarter of colleges and universities are doing what we're doing. And doing well doing what we're doing. And, well, then that's even a smaller yeah, amount. Exactly. And even of those that say they're doing this, very few have. We have the super majority of our students. 76% of our students live on campus. And I'll tell you, we're hearing, uh, we did a survey that, you know, a lot more want to come back in the spring because we've been successful. Uh, and the super majority of our classes are taught in person too. And that's Mine as a, are all in person. And that's I know for a lot of faculty, that's not an easy thing because, you know, there's concerns whether they have their own family members or their own reasons that they might be at risk. So I think I've learned, what I've learned about the Ursinus community is that, you know, we're pretty um, amazing right. in our ability to be able to uh, work through a pandemic as a community. You know, I always say, you know, with good luck and, and good behavior, we'll make it through. I can tell you in the beginning, a lot of people didn't think that was going to be possible. And that's good behavior by everyone, not just students, that's faculty, staff, that's all of us working together. And, and we have. So the, the, the biggest thing I've learned is as a community, um, we were actually able to do something pretty remarkable. Absolutely. You had a second part it, to your yeah, question. Just, uh, what, what would you like to leave as a message going forward to, to everyone that, that works, lives at our sinus? And we're all part of this same group trying to make this happen. Um, and I think it's if, if any one or two, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And if some people didn't do the things they were doing, we couldn't be this successful. So I just say thank you to the entire community for being able to allow us uh, to be in this space today. And again, things can anything can happen. Right. So I don't want to get too cocky, but um, I, I just uh, really want to uh, show my appreciation to the entire community, the faculty, the staff, uh, the students, the parents. Right. It's not easy for parents to 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 put your uh, students in, into these in, into college. Europe. So uh, just thank you to everybody. Thank you to President Flomberg. We're going to be doing two episodes a semester. That is our goal. Um, and we're going to try to do it for all four of my years here. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. Thank you all for watching episode one of the Sparks to Skyscrapers podcast. We had an amazing time interviewing President Brock Blomberg all about the COVID-19 innovations that brought us back to campus during the pandemic. I'm home for Thanksgiving now, so episode two is going to be a Zoom interview with Jake Reichardt, who's a U Imagine scholar that started a clothing company from his basement in high school. That company is now sponsored by the well-known brand Champion. We'll see you in episode two. We're going to try to do two episodes a semester so that you guys have your innovation content throughout all of my four years here at Ursinus. Thank you all for watching again, and we'll see you next time on Sparks to Skyscrapers.